up and roll. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Uh, I'm a funny looking Josh, but we'll do what we can do here. Um, we have prayer announcements and prayer. Uh, we have a hymn. Then we're going to be looking at Second Peter, and then looking at Jeremiah, and closing with a hymn. Saturday, May 14th, uh, we have uh, the Pioma, Pioma Foundation's Human Trafficking Seminar presented by Rebecca, Rebecca Jowers. And you can watch us on YouTube. There's the cartoon that Josh gave us. This is Grasshopper and Honey. I ordered the locust. I guess I had interesting pizzas back in those days. <clears throat> Okay, um, at this point we'll go off air and we'll come back with uh, Second Peter. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Today we're going to be continuing through Peter's second letter. We'll be taking, starting up in chapter 2, verse 4. But before we begin, let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this time we gather together in your word. We pray for your blessings as we progress through it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in verse 1 to 3, Peter identified who the false teachers were and how they were. And I described them as those who denied them. He described them as those who denied a master. They are unbelievers teaching in the church a false doctrine of Christology, doctrine of Christ, and arm of theology, the doctrine of salvation. And the way they work, they operate secretly. They attempt to hide their destructive heresies and some truth. And they themselves deny Jesus Christ by believing their own heresies and blasphemies. They infect others. Their immorality will be their drawing card to attract some of the church members. And they'll bring discredit to the faith. The way of the truth will be maligned and evilly spoke to, spoken of. They will exploit you with false words. They want your money and they want power. And now beginning in verse 4, Peter explains the consequences that follow false teaching in order to help his readers see the importance of avoiding it. Before we go there, I want to point out the way Peter constructed the next passage. In verses 4 to 10a, they form one long, complex conditional sentence verses 4 to 8 form the conditional statement and verses 9 to 10 a the conclusion the conditional statement contains three examples of God not sparing judgment in the past <clears throat> verses 9 to 10 a he concludes with the then statements he rescues then he rescues the godly and the punishment for the unrighteous pointing to the false teachers, is sure to come. The contrast is between not sparing the God ungodly and then rescuing the godly. Peter was intent on demonstrating that God will judge false teachers and others who sin against him and his word. History, Peter wrote, gives ample verification of this truth. So let's look at verses 4 to 6. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought, a, brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who live ungodly lives. Peter could have used any one of these statements to illustrate his point, but he used all three, each adding great emphasis to his point that God does not spare judgment for the ungodly. Not even the angels are spared. Satan and his followers were cast into hell and committed to pits into the pit of darkness when they rebelled against God. And they are reserved for future judgment they will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. There will be no future trial 
for their doom is already sealed. False prophets, Peter argued, will taste the same judgment as these rebellious angels. And not even the ancient world was spared. Except for eight godly people, Noah and his family, the entire human civilization at the time was drowned by the flood brought by God and thereby cast into hell. Although Peter did not say it here, they too are reserved for eternal judgment in the lake of fire. Peter reminded them and those who are the targets of their delusions that God can judge evil even when it involves the entire human civilization. Do the false teachers think that they will escape? Absolutely not. In verse 5, Peter denounces the idea that some are preserved from judgment. Noah and his family were preserved. They were kept, they were guarded from this judgment. He was a preacher of righteousness. They were a godly family. His so angels were not spared, and the ancient world was not spared. And later, not even entire cities can be, you know, are spared. Sodom and Gomorrah were totally destroyed. Every resident of those two cities was destroyed by fire, reduced to ashes. And again, although not mentioned by Peter, all the citizens of those two cities were cast into hell, where they await their total destruction in a lake of fire. Peter concluded this illustration by saying that God made them an example a model or a pattern of what is going to happen to the ungodly. The apostle's purpose here was to cite this historical incident of judgment, not to elaborate on the cause for such severe destruction. His point was that the false teachers will not be able to escape total destruction. The word for destruction here is the same as we found earlier. It means fatally destructive. This destruction <clears throat> results in eternal death. In verse 4, a third of the angels were ungodly. God cast them into hell. In verse 5, the whole world at that time was ungodly. And God cast them into hell. And in verse 6, we have examples on a smaller scale that God will cast the ungodly of entire cities into hell. The point is that the ungodly will be judged and the false teachers are ungodly and their judgment is certain. Now Peter goes on to explain the divine deliverance of the godly. In verse 4, not mentioned by Peter, is that two-thirds of the angels were saved from judgment. In verse 5, Noah and his family were preserved from judgment. And now in verse 7, we find that Lot was re rescued from this, this destruction. So verse 7, and, he, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day by day by their lawless deeds. Here again is an interesting New Testament commentary on a fam familiar Old Testament passage. In Genesis 19, Lot hardly comes across as a righteous man. Possibly godliness was not a consistent mark of his daily conduct. But in his standing before God, he was justified. This is evidenced by the fact that Lot was distressed. He was tormented, oppressed by the enormity of the iniquity all around him. The people in these twin cities were filthy in sexual debauchery. The men who oppressed Lot were unprincipled, meaning without law, lawless, <clears throat> and they're involved in lawless deeds. Besides being distressed, Lot was also tormented or tortured in his righteous soul. Seeing and hearing about all their vile ways day after day grieved Lot to the point of inner torture. In verse 9, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who indulged the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. So in verses 4 to 7, we see the four ifs, and now in verse 9, he gives us the then, the conclusion. 
in verses 9 to 10 a is a conclusion drawn from Peter's examples and there's two parts to this conclusion God preserves and he rescues the godly from temptation in verse 9 a and Paul gives us another Paul gives us a promise similar to this he says no ten, in 1 Corinthians 10 13 no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man and God is faithful who allow not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but will with the temptation provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it so God indeed preserves and rescues his own by providing a way out he did this for a lot and he does did this for Peter's readers but just as in Lot's case the ways offered and Lot had to obey by taking it many times it may appear that the godly are judged along with the ungodly it could be that they don't take the way out or God may have some other purpose in the case of Peter's readers God provided them a push and a way out of Jerusalem before his judgment fell upon it by the way of Romans. If any of the godly remained behind, they would endure the judgment that falls upon the unrighteous. The sense in this passage is if God provides a way of escape for Noah and Lot, he will also provide a way for his godly readers. And the second conclusion is that God is keeping the un ungodly under punishment for the day of judgment. If God has judged the ungodly angels, and if he's judged the ungodly inhabitants of the earth in Noah's day, then surely he will judge the ungodly today. For some, it might not appear that they suffer judgment in this life on the earth, but there's that day of judgment coming, and they will be part of it. And this is a day when all the ungodly of all times will appear before the great white judgment seat of Jesus. They will be judged and thrown in the eternal lake of fire, where they will suffer and be tormented forever. In verse 10, Peter has a special mention for those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. And this is why Peter gave the third example of God's judging the ungodly in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. This judgment was extreme because of their extreme fleshly corruption and their despising of authority. The word especially in verse 10 means to an unusual degree, most of all, above all, especially, particularly. It's not that their judgment is more certain than the others, but that judgment will be to a greater degree than others. And verse 10b continues the sentence. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord well, beginning in verse 10 Peter devotes a long section to the description of false teachers and here he points out eight characteristics of these false teachers in 10 false teachers are characterized by lawlessness as seen in the way they blasphemely rebuke against any authority. Peter has in mind here the authority of God. And secondly, false teachers are characterized by arrogance. They are daring, they're self-willed, to the point that they rebuke angelic power and authority, even when these angels know their place and will not bring a railing rebuke against angels before the Lord because they know it's not their place or function. In verse 12, but these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. So thirdly, thirdly false teachers are ignorant. They're like unreasoning animals destined for destruction. I think of commercials a few years ago when California advertised their happy cows. Anybody remember those commercials? <laughs> <clears throat> Last year, Barb and I uh, toured a dairy farm in Tennessee, and we saw happy and content cows. I mean, everything was provided for them. They did, they did and went wherever they wanted 
they didn't have a concern in the world. Even their environment was, was provided, the best environment. They had no idea, though, that in six years they would be sold to a butcher shop. They just happily given milk, you know. They were automatic milk machines. Any time, 24 hours a day, they, those cows felt like they needed to give the milk. They just, they knew where to walk. They walked in there. They all was taken care of and they walked out. I mean, they didn't have a need in the world. But six years later, they didn't know anything about that coming. And false teachers are so ignorant that they have no knowledge or idea that in destroying their followers, they too will be destroyed. They do not see their own coming judgment and eternal destruction. And they continually to continue to happily deceive and sow destruction to others. In verse 13, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to, revive, to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. So fourthly, false teachers are characterized by wrongdoing and deception. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, in verse 12, we saw their ignorance in that in their destruct, destructing, they are destroyed. And here we see their ignorance in that in their wrongdoing, they suffer the results of their wrongdoing. In the daytime, they luxuriously delight in their self-indulgences. They believe they're God's gift to mankind. Yet the truth is, they are stains and blemishes of mankind, reveling in their deceptions while they feast and entertain with you in fellowship. Lou and Nita puts it this way, they are like dirty spots in your fellowship meals, for they feast together shamelessly. <clears throat> they do this, having eyes full of adultery, that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed their accursed children. So fifthly, false teachers are characterized by their immorality and their licentiousness. False teachers have eyes full of adultery as they see all women as potential adulteresses. And this is to the extent that this is their way of life. Their heart is trained in greed and they are cursed by God because they are guilty of enticing weaker brethren. These weaker brethren then fall into a state of immorality because of their false teachers. Verse 15, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression for a, from a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. So the sixth characteristic is they're guilty with the guilt of Balaam as he forsook the right way. He loved unrighteousness. False teachers love the wages of pleasures of unrighteousness. Fruchtamon says they sin for money's sake. Well, at least Balaam, when rebuked by his own dumb donkey, had the sense to listen to what the donkey had to say. Balaam realized that this dumb donkey could only speak as a result of supernatural power. Therefore, he learned a lesson from this dumb donkey. False teachers are not willing to learn anything. So they, they're guilty of the guilt of, Beor, of uh, Balaam, but they don't learn anything. They don't listen to the, the donkey when he speaks. <clears throat> 17. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity they entire, entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from, from the ones who live in error promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. So the seventh characteristic of a false teacher is they are empty of content. They're void. They appear to be great Bible teachers, but instead they're devoid of 
anything good. They are destined for the blackness of darkness. The place of utter darkness is a description of the lake of fire. And this is a paradox because usually fire gives off light, right? But the fire in the lake of fire is only for punishment, not for light. Their arrogant teaching is totally empty. They teach the pleasure of sin, but there's no pleasure or satisfaction found in sin. They use the hook of licentiousness or shameful immorality, and they entice those who barely escape from the one who, who live in error, their unsaved companions. In verse 18, there are two views of who those who barely escape are. One view is such propaganda and sensual license appeals to some people who are just learning the gospel and weighing its claim on their lives. The enticed people are those escaping from uh, those who live in error, their companions. Those are not believers, according to most commentators. The second view is the false teachers appeal to people who are barely escaping from those who live in error. This group probably includes new Christians and or older carnal ones who are still in the process of making a final break from their pagan past. When reading verse 18 in its relationship with verses 20 and 22, it appears to me that the first view might be better since believers, even brand new ones, can't lose their salvation. I think Peter is thinking of those who are learning about the Christian way of life and are yet actually even changing their lifestyle, uh, but they're still unsaved. Now we'll get more into this when we get to verse 20, so I'll save that until then. In verse 19, false teachers are declared to be the bondservants of corruption. They promise freedom, but instead they enslave to sin. And in so doing, they themselves become slaves of corruption. They promise liberty, but instead they deliver over to bondage, the same bondage that they are slaves of. <clears throat> Verse 20, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For if it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. For if after they, so who are they? That's the question here. There's three main views of who they are in this verse. Some suggest that the word they refers to false teachers rather than the targets of their attack. <clears throat> Second view is the connection between the end of verse 18, people are just escaping those who live in error, and the beginning of verse 20, if they've escaped the corruption of the world, seems to favor a reference to unstable unsaved people who were listeners of the gospel. The third view, others think that the reference might encompass both false teachers and their converts who can lose their salvation. This, however, runs counter to many passages in the scripture that assure believers of eternal salvation. The first view that it is referring to false teachers will seem to be the correct view when put in context of what Peter's teaching in the whole of chapter two. The topic is false teachers and descriptions of them and what happens to them. And if this is correct, then Peter has already stated that false teachers, because of their immorality, are headed for a special judgment in verse 10. <clears throat> the second view to me seems to be to best connect the ones who barely escape in verse 18 to the they in verse 20. If there truly is the connection here, then those in verse 18 must be unbelievers who have heard of the word, have been led by false teachers to reject it, since again, believers cannot lose their salvation. <clears throat> 
And the third view, I believe, was the Bible knowledge commentary in that believers, even brand new ones, uh, are saved and cannot lose their salvation. They will not experience the judgment of the lost. However, in thinking about this, we remember we went through the book of Hebrews a little while back, and that kind of offers a fourth view here. <coughs> Hebrews in chapter 6 talks about those who fall away after knowing the truth. And we discovered that these were basically carnal Christians who might want to go back to Jerusalem to avoid the present persecution. When, when you see this chapter 6 in context of the book of Peter, they're Jewish believers, they're in Jerusalem, they uh, are being to terribly persecuted. And remember, this persecution actually drives Peter's listeners out of Jerusalem to these other countries. And uh, God used this persecution to get a, you know, most of the believers out of the way for when the Romans come. But uh, before that happens, you know, some of the Hebrews were getting tired of this persecution and they might have been thinking, man, if I could just go to the Jew to go to the rabbis or the elders or whatever and say, I give it up, I'm coming back, I'm turning this all in, then they could just live amongst their brethren, the you know, the Hebrew brethren in peace. No more persecution. <clears throat> and it probably was uh looked like a pretty good idea to some of them. But P but the writer of Hebrews warned them that if you do this uh, there's no way back again you will be suffering basically the same as they suffered uh, they were warned that there would be no return and we know later that uh, the suffering from the fall of Jerusalem with no possibility of escape they would be going through that they would, lose, they would not lose their salvation but they would lose their life. And in this case, in verse 20, you could say that fourth view would also include new Jewish believers as well as carnal Jewish believers. In verse 20 again, it says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be far better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. <clears throat> the Bible Knowledge Commentary sums it up this way. Whether they, in verse 20, refers to the teachers of their victims or their victims, both groups had available to them knowledge about Jesus Christ, which would produce liberty in life. But when the knowledge was rejected, their end was deeper corruption, <coughs> again entangled in it and overcome, and presumably a more severe degree of punishment. Indeed, they would have been better off uh, never to have known the gospel, the way of righteousness, and the sacred holy commandment, the apostles' message here, than to have known the truth and have deliberately violated it. <clears throat> so, that, um, I tend to go along with the Bible knowledge commentary here that whether it's talking about the, the false teachers or their followers, they're basically talking, uh, Peter's talking about with in mind unbelievers um, who have unbelievers who are listening to these false teachers, but they've been exposed to the gospel. And as we know in a lot of churches today, you come into a church, you're told how to live. You know, this is, you're reading the Bible. The Bible says to stop doing this, start, to, you know, start living this way. Well, an unbeliever could actually start turning his life around uh, in response to the teaching and uh, stuff like that. And, um, but still not reach the point where he has actually accepted Christ as his savior. And I believe that these are the ones he's talking about here. And things are going to go worse for them than if they had never gotten that far. However, when we look at context, verse 22, I think, really kind of nails it. 
It has happened to them according to their true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. <clears throat> Jews considered both dogs and pigs among the lowest form of creatures. So Peter chose these animals to describe people who knew the truth and turned away from it. The first proverb, a dog returns to his vomit, is taken from Proverbs 26, 11. The second proverb, a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud, was presumably a commonly known proverb by the Jews in the first century. The underlying principle of both of these is the same. These apostates, whether they're false teachers or they're victims, or both, never were what they seemed to be, and they returned to what they had been all along. Dogs and pigs cannot be scrubbed. They can be scrubbed, but they can't be kept clean. For it is in their very nature to return to unclean living. And such apostates are in a tighter bondage. They are farther from the truth, and they are deeper in spiritual filth than ever before. So just like dogs are dogs, they can't stop being a dog. Uh, sows are sows, they don't stop being a sow. Sinners are sinners, and they don't stop being a sinner, no matter how they act. Uh, when a person is saved, they cease from being a sinner and they become a saint who sometimes sins. Uh, once a person is saved, they're no longer a sinner. Well, a, a dog or a sow never stop being a dog or a sow. And they always go back to where they were. And that's describing the, the ones he's talking about in chapters in verse 20 and 22 and also 18. So that kind of, whoever they are, They've got the unbelievers who are never saved. The reason they return to who they were is because they were always who they were. An unbeliever sitting in church learning from the teaching and even studying his Bible and, and even changing his lifestyle, beginning to appear as a godly man, if he does not become a believer, he will eventually leave that church and return to his prior life of sin. And because of that, things will be worse for him then than they would have been if he had never gotten, done what he'd done. And I believe this verse 22 wraps up any discussion of who they are in verses 18 to 21. They are unsaved followers of the false teachers and possibly the false teachers themselves because we already know uh, that we've read this morning that Peter has told his readers that the false teachers suffer the same judgment as the ones that they mislead. The destruction that they sow destroys them. The wrongdoing that they do destroys them. And the destruction they cause in the lives of these unbelievers condemning them to hell and uh, is the same destruction that they will follow. So whether verses 20 and 21 are for just their followers, it basically includes them also. <clears throat> Believers today do well to heed Peter's warning against false teachers, to learn how to discern truth for themselves and to teach it to others. The false teachers will themselves meet eternal destruction and others will be destroyed by them. But Christians can wage spiritual warfare more effectively if they know their spiritual enemies, the techniques that they use, and at the end the result of uh, their, their end result is uh, they will be, you know, they're being deceived. So we need, as believers, we need to, to recognize false teachers for who they are and refuse to sit under them. Any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. uh, one comment and then one question. Mm -hmm. um, that verse 18 and such, I, the first thing that came to my mind was the parable of the sower. And then um, to follow up with, um, it would be better if they had not known the right way than to have known it and rejected the truth. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I've read or heard that there, there's also 
um, the first level of heaven or a stage of heaven, but not completely heaven. And so if I'm not mistaken, there's like levels of heaven. And if that's true, are there levels of hell? Some people teach that there are. Levels of hell? I have not studied yeah. personally, you know, the different levels of hell. Uh, there's the Jewish words for it in the Old Testament. The uh, Hebrew words, there's... Uh, well, are there different levels of heaven then? Well, Paul mentions he went into the third, third heaven. Level, yeah. Third heaven. I don't know what it's called levels, but third meaning a different heaven than the second heaven. Right. Uh, the second heaven, and then there would be a first heaven. The first heaven would be maybe our atmosphere and in, in Genesis God created the heavens plural okay. and the earth but whether they're levels or different you know you, you have to go and you know think about it a little harder to whether does it, is it the same level same heaven with a different level or is it a different heaven yeah. um, so the yeah, other is evidence there are uh, different heavens there's more than one heaven um, but I've never studied the different levels of, of hell. Um, not sure that makes any difference to me personally. <laughs> well, no, true, but I mean, you would think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's natural for us being hopefully graceful and loving individuals. We see well, there's people that we know that are not accepting Christ and that they live a good life uh, we know that they didn't make it into heaven so it's it's more comfortable to us to think that maybe they didn't go that far down as hell as some other people have so I don't know exactly where you know the different different level teaching comes from whether it's Jewish tradition whether it's the actual Old Testament that's that's something that we'll have to take up and study I guess Anybody yeah, else? No, anything? <laughs> I guess a, a thought on that is that here it's talked about the wages of unrighteousness. And mm -hmm. you know that for the believer, there are wages or rewards for submitting to God mm -hmm. and obeying Him. So it's not necessarily that I'm a better Christian, therefore I'm at some exalted position or some exactly. greater position in heaven or I've achieved some greater level, but there will be differing amounts of rewards for those right. done with right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then possibly on the flip side, and this is, uh, I don't have anything to substantiate this necessarily, but uh, could it be possible that there are differing levels of punishment for those? In other words, same have, hell, but different levels of punishment. Those maybe intentionally mm -hmm. and purposefully disobey God at every turn, as opposed to those who may be more in ignorance. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter definitely indicates that judgment for these false teachers is going to be worse than the judgment for others. Um, and in the, on the physical side, Sodom and Gomorrah were selected out of all the immorality, immoral people on earth because of its intensity there. Uh, that God destroyed those, I mean, he, it's like, woof, and they were incinerated just like that. And... Uh, so their judgment on the physical side uh, was actually worse than uh, the judgment of, of, the, <laughs> of a lot of others. So, well, when I responding to that, uh, I know uh, Peter mentioned that uh, Judas was sent to his own place. He emphasized that his own place. Mm -hmm. thing is though that from what I understand before the final judgment there is this place called Hades and uh, it's where that time during the Old Testament before Jesus rose there was a Hades and a paradise they called it I think and when he resurrected the ones in paradise went up with him and the other ones stayed where they were. Mm -hmm. And then I assume then that at the final judgment that uh, 
those that are in the Hades part are going to now be thrown into the lake of fire, which is what seemed like measurably worse than Hades was. And, uh, it, and the way it writes in, in some of the parts you see is that there are certain levels of hell. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things we don't know. I know. It's, and it's and, and the only thing, and also, mind. and also, I just want to make, to just emphasize, you know, that uh, that there's different levels of punishment. It causes us to make th may, uh, maybe think that there's different levels of hell, but it doesn't necessitate necessitate that. Uh, there can be one Hades, like you put, or one hell. And different people could be punished more severely than others while they're there. Um, and paradise is a place uh, that uh, the righteous go to rest. That may not be part of hell. Uh, I, I never studied that, you know, before, you know, in depth. Uh, so I was just my. This is just my talking. But there's, you know, there's questions here, you know. Does different levels mean the same thing as uh, different punishments, or can there be different levels of punishment in the same hell? Um, got you, got assignment there for you. <laughs> well, if you put it like that, you have Earth, and you have all the people on Earth, and they are in very different situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and you, I guess it's possible to receive more than one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least a few different types of that. Yeah. Yep. That might be hard to bear. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after you cast them all before the Lord, anyway. I mean. Yeah. Um. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, leave that. Uh, Bible study for some other time. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Father, we just simply ask that you continue to urge us to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we might keep ourselves safe from false teachers and even the false teaching of godly men who teach error. And we just ask you to do this for us, Lord, and we ask you to come quickly as we continue to love and to serve you and and grow in him during these last times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>